last year at Open Ed, Gardner Campbell gave what was, I think, one of the best keynotes that, that I've ever seen. Um, he wove together T.S. Eliot and Gregory Bateson and um, Pete Townsend and Robert Mitchum to tell a really interesting story about what it means to be open. Um, and when, when David Wiley asked me earlier this year to come and give a keynote here, I thought, holy crap, like, I cannot possibly follow Gardner Campbell on stage. Um, thankfully, yesterday morning, the bar was set a little bit lower, and I'm feeling a lot more confident about what, what I'm gonna tell you today. Um, <laughs> It's also very convenient yesterday that one of the keynotes didn't actually mention open education a single time. So if I leave that out of my talk today, it's pretty cool as well. Um, like Gardner, my background is actually in the humanities. And so what I want to talk about, <laughs> what I want to talk about is culture and storytelling. Um, I want to talk about metaphor. And I actually want to steal some of Gardner's rhetorical moves because that's what we do, right? We steal. Uh, I want to talk about the apocalypse because I feel as though actually one of, this is actually one of the dominant narratives in education right now. This notion that somehow we're in the end times and that things are on the verge of some sort of, we're in the middle of some sort of massive crisis and potentially um, we'll have some sort of moment, of moment of salvation. So I want us to think about education. I want us to think about the apocalypse. Judgment Day, who's telling these stories and why. We'll, we'll read aloud the poem because I know you're not supposed to read aloud poem slides, but Gardner does. So, um, turning in, uh, tuning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer, things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, the blood dimmed, dimmed tide is lucid and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity and a shit ton of venture capital. <laughs> and a music lyric, because, you know, Gardner's a little bit poetry, a little bit rock and roll. That's great, it starts with an earthquake, birds and snakes, an airplane, and Stephen Downs is not afraid. <laughs> it's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. Okay, so I'm talking about doom, not that doom, a different doom. Uh, it's pointing to groom. Um, so anyway, Harold Camping. Harold Camping predicted that the world would end on May 21st, 2011. The rapture would occur, as alluded to in 1 Thessalonians, and when the dead in Christ who are alive and remain are caught up into the air to meet the Lord, that is all the righteous, the living and the dead, would be lifted into heaven, May 21st. Now on May 22nd, Camping emerged from his house flabbergasted. Um, and he revised his predictions. Initially, he stated that on May 21st, the rapture would occur, followed by five months of fire and brimstone before the world would end on October 21st. LOL, JK. Um, he revised his prediction to say, actually, the world and the rapture would occur and the world would end on October 21st. Oops. Um, now, Camping never actually had a huge following. He had a radio station, Family Radio. It only served about 100 markets. But so rather than relying on the radio waves, he got a bunch, purchased a bunch of billboards around the country, warning people of the impending Judgment Day. And it was a really successful marketing campaign. People heard of Camping who'd never heard of this before. He actually raised millions of dollars as well. Because I guess that's what you do to prepare for the end times is that you, you write a check to your preacher. Um, but so the marketing, marketing campaign was really successful, but as far as end times prediction goes, it was a failure. Um, you know, these doom or salvation filled stories about the end of the world, well, they've always been, you know, I mean, here we stand today, they've always been a failure. They've been wrong again and again and again and again. Actually, Wikipedia lists over 170 dates that were predicted for the end of the world that have come and gone, and a couple dozen more that are still yet to come. One of those dates 
2045 is the singularity. Um, the singularity is that moment when uh, as futurist AI researcher and Google's director of engineering, Ray Kurzweil says um, in his book, The Singularity is Near, that humans will transcend their biology. Now, again, this is Google's director of engineering. Let me re this is not some guy who runs a small Christian radio station. Google's director of engineering says the singularity will mark this moment when we have the creation of superintelligence through technology, the replacement of our human flesh with more advanced machines, ever more complex prosthetic devices, hearing implants, eye implants, limb replacements, and eventually will replace the human brain itself. The singularity, some also say, could bring about vast self-replicating nanotechnology that will eventually cover the world in a gray goo. But we don't need to worry, don't worry. Even if we destroy the environment, it doesn't matter because according to Kurzweil, we'll be able to upload our brains into computers. So much like the rapture has long promised, once we'll be able to abandon this painful earthly existence, we will be able to live forever inside the machine. Now, this is some sort of technological salvation. Some people call it the rapture of the nerds. Now, no surprise, a lot of futurists actually bristle at this notion of the rapture of the nerds to describe the singularity. Because they say, you know, do not compare us to religious eschatology for crying out loud. There is no parallel between our beliefs and the beliefs of, of the Bible, for example. The singularity is rational, they say, <laughs> right? Religious faith is not rational. Um, like other failed times and other failed end times predictions, they argue that the singularity is really coming, <laughs> really because it's based on science, <laughs> science, while the judgment day is just a myth. Now folklorists bristle, I think, at the common usage of myth to mean the lie. Um, a myth, by, according to folklorists, is really quite the, ob the opposite of a lie. A myth is a culture's most sacred story. It involves supernatural um, or supreme beings, sure, it explains our origins and our destinies. So a myth is really the capital T truth. So I want to talk to you today about myths, about narratives of the education apocalypse, about eschatology, mythology, MOOCs, millennialism. And I do so not just as someone who observes education technology, but as someone who is trained academically as a folklorist. And I figure, hello, if you can have a PhD in computer science and from Stanford and run an education company, you sure the hell can have a master's degree in folklore and talk about education, right? Why not? Um, and as much as being an ed tech writer does make me pay attention to products and policies and venture capital investment, I really do spend a lot of time thinking about the stories that we tell. I'm fascinated by the way in which these end time stories are really what how we're framing education today. It's the end of the university as we know it, as TechCrunch sort of gleefully proclaims. And I think it's in this sort of great American tradition of Harold Camping, of Ray Kurzweil, of Cotton Mather even, that, the, that we're at this moment of where so many of us believe in an apocalypse, where we predict a date or several dates, depending on the predictions that you heed. Take Sebastian Thrun and his MOOC millennialism, for example. He's an AI researcher. He's a faculty member at Stanford. He's actually also a faculty member at Ray Kurzweil's Singularity University, which is an education for profit that is interested in sort of developing ideas, moving us forward towards the singularity. And of course, Sebastian Thrun is the co-founder of a MOOC startup, Udacity. And he has predicted that in 50 years, there will be only 10 universities left in the world. And of course, Udacity, he says, has a shot at being one of them. 50 years, so that would be 2062, which is about 17 years after Kurzweil predicts the singularity. So it's gonna be great, really. A planet covered in gray goo, when there's only 10 universities and we all live inside the machine. I cannot wait.
Um, but you know, the singularity actually is listed in Wikipedia's, in Wikipedia's list of, of apocalypses, but this sort of MOOC apocalypse, the sort of destruction of universities by MOOCs is not listed there, nor actually is the great campus tsunami, which is the phrase used by Stanford, uh, Stanford President John Hennessy to describe the coming changes in education, nor um, is the great education avalanche, which is what Pearson Sir Michael Barber describes, the sort of coming cataclysm that's going to sort of take us, sweep us all away, or freeze us in ice forever. And nor is this notion of disruptive innovation, which I think is actually one of the most influential millennial millennialist myths in the contemporary business world, um, particularly in the tech industry. Of course, <clears throat> Clayton Christensen, the originator of the phrase, doesn't really offer a specific date when we're all going to be uh, disrupted. Rather, it's an industry by industry transformation, a salvation, of course, by market forces, not God, but that other invisible hand. Um, I don't mean to suggest when I say that this is a myth, again, that C Clayton Christensen's ideas are a lie or a falsehood. Um, I mean it actually is a sacred story that people have widely and uncritically accepted. It's sort of unassailably true. Um, no doubt he's a Harvard professor, right? So he's faced very little skepticism or criticism about his ideas, about the transformation of the world. It's almost as if the innovate, his book, The Innovators, Innovators Dilemma, is some sort of sacred text. And sort of helping to enhance it as this sort of mythological storytelling. We also have this idea around sort of myth-making and marketing working together. And now suddenly everything in technology is a disruptive innovation. You name it and it's sort of labeled as this sort of um, earth-shattering destructive force, right? If you can summon your a limousine with an iPhone, that's a disruptive innovation. If you can pay for things online, that's a disruptive innovation. If you make an electric car, that's a disruptive innovation. If you put videos on YouTube, that's a disruptive innovation. If you add multiple choice questions to it, that's a disruptive innovation. Um, you know, if you use Facebook to search for people instead of Google, that's a disruptive innovation. And it might be that some of these things are innovative. I mean, I know the multiple choice test is pretty pretty cutting edge. Um, but I think if you're looking for disruptive innovation, at least according to the way in which, um, in which Christensen describes it, it's a pretty specific sort of creative destruction, which again is the sort of unexamined millennialism in the way in which we talk about business practices. Um, and it's the way in which, according to Christensen at least, the processes by which a product or service enter, um, enter the, at the bottom of a market by people who are not currently being served and eventually relentlessly, inevitably, all with this language of sort of, of, of inevitable change, they move up the market and eventually displace, displace the established competitors. Now, according to Christensen's framework, there are innovations that aren't necessarily disruptive. There are, for example, sustaining innovations, right? So these are innovations that strengthen the position and the profits of markets that are already in place. But really, that's not the mythology that's being embraced and talked about today, particularly by the tech industry, which seems, despite its economic and increasingly politi its increasing political power, seems to still think of itself as an upstart at the bottom of the market, overthrowing the lords above it. And sort of as a, as a self-appointed and self-described disruptor, the tech industry really has latched on to the sort of millennial narrative around technology. That is, all of these predictions about the destruction of the old and the replacement of the new, the salvation through technology, all at the hands of these new tools that we're adopting. And it means, for example, the death of the music industry, the death of newspapers, the death of print, the death of books, the death of library, the death of RSS, the death of schools, the death of universities, the death of the web, and on and on. All predicted to be killed or squeezed away or eventually disrupted. And the structure to this narrative I think is really interesting to me. Um, and it's one that we hear again and again in these sort of religious stories, right? There's this sort of sense of doom, a period of suffering, 
there's Armageddon, and then we have paradise. The people are drawn to end of the world as we know it stories for reasons that I think that have a lot to do with the horror, the horror of the world and I think the sort of heaven and hope that we attach to the future. Many cultures, and Silicon Valley is really just one sort of example of this, um, tell stories where they predict some sort of cataclysmic event that are going to reshape and change the world and make it a better place. There's some sort of political transformation or cultural transformation or technological transformation that's going to bring about a better world. In the book of Revelations is one example, the Mayan calendar, the shakers, the ghost dance, nuclear holocaust has even been framed that way, the singularity, and certainly, certainly MOOCs. Now, I'll be the first to admit that folklore professor Dan Wojcik, um, his book, The End of the World as We Know It, is quite dated. And full disclosure, he was also my master's thesis advisor way back in 2000 when I finished my degree. And he published his book about the end times in 1997, which is incidentally the same year that Clayton Christensen first published The Innovator's Dilemma. So in this book, you know, Wojcik talks about the way in which we believe in American culture in particular in the end of the world. And I think it was interesting that he timed this book to come out right before 2000 when we saw a real increase in, in the sort of end times fear. The year 2000 had been, a, had been predicted to be the end of the world many times before. There was also this growing fear, for those of you that might recall, and the sort of technological destruction, right, with the Y2K bug, that suddenly, as, our, as we were beginning to become more and more computer-oriented, that we were going to have this sort of massive Armageddon based on our inability to sort of code dates correctly in our computers. Um, and I think that, it, that this was one of the things that makes it really interesting to think about the year 2000 as this sort of profoundly significant moment where we start to think about this fear or hope for change. And it, interestingly, sort of Christensen's, Clayton Christensen's framework about disruptive innovation maps quite, quite keenly onto that as well. So really, I mean, how pervasive are these end times myths? According to survey, 40% of Americans believe that there is nothing that we can do to stop nuclear holocaust. 60% believe in Judgment Day. 44% believe in the Battle of Armageddon. 44% believe in the rapture. Around 20% of Americans feared or believed that Y2K was going to disrupt their lives. Um, end of the world fears in America actually increased after 9-11. One in 10 Americans believe that the world will end in their lifetime. Excuse me, one in 10 believe in the Mayan calendar, which was, I think, December of last year. Um, one in five believe that the world will end in their lifetime. So this is a pretty, this is a pretty significant um, a belief in American culture. And I think we should think about how, what does it mean to have this sort of pervasive belief in the end times? How does it shape the way in which we address the future? And when it comes to education, how does it shape the way in which we think about education, which is, after all, the way in which we plan for the future? If we believe that the world is about to end, how are we going to address education? Now, I'm not actually sure how many Americans believe in the singularity. Um, I don't, as we're hearing more and more stories in the news about robots taking over our jobs, perhaps this will become a more, a more predominant belief. I am particularly curious, however, how many people in Silicon Valley, how many people in the technology industry, how many people at a place that hires a director of engineering who believes in the singularity, how many people in Silicon Valley believe in that particular end time story? Particularly curious how many people who are AI professors who start MOOC startups believe that we will be working, living in a world of gray goo. Um, I can't find any polls on that subject. And I'm also curious to how many people believe in this notion of disruptive innovation as well. Because I think that there is a real power in this particular story. I think that Clayton Christensen's definition of disruptive innovation really taps into this way in which Americans think about the end times, the way in which we sort of whether they're Americans or the Shakers or the Heaven's Gate followers, remember those guys, they had like the cool shoes, um, or venture capitalists, 
or Java programmers. I don't know what their end times myths be, but every time I see a security update in Apple, I'm pretty sure that there is some sort of eschatology around, around Java. Um, I think folks are really drawn to these millennialist stories, and I think that they help justify and frame the way in which we think about the world. Now, of course, Harvard Business School might seem like, a, like an odd place to have an origin for a millennialist framework. To use Christensen's own, for his own terminology, perhaps Harvard would be a sustaining innovation and not a disruptive one. And I think it's worth pointing out, though, that, that Clayton Christensen is a member of the Church of Latter-day Saints. I think he attended BYU, and he really does actually talk about some of his things and some of his beliefs in terms of, in terms of religious language as well. Um, just last month, he gave a keynote at the National Education Reform Summit in which he sort of, he was talking about measurement, which is an hour-long keynote that you probably don't want to sit through. But it was an hour-long keynote talking about measurement, but he was framing the way in which business, business talks about itself in terms of religion. He talked about business practices as the church of the new finance. He talked about the way in which um, people who belong to the church of new finance really believe in the doctrine of business. He talked about the high priests in the church of new finance who are, he said, business professors like him. So it's worth asking, like, what, you know, what do these business professors, what do these high priests predict? Here are a couple of Christensen's predictions. In 15 years, half the universities in the, in the US will be bankrupt. By the year 2019, half of all classes in grades K through 12 will be taught online. Just last weekend in the New York Times, he said that there are a host of struggling colleges and universities. The bottom 25% will disappear or will merge in the next 10 to 15 years. So we have this sort of 10 to 15 year window of predictions where doom is going to unfold. I mean, guess doom if you, doom if you work at one of these universities, salvation and promise if you're investing in the for-profit alternatives. Um, disruptive innovation is really this thing that I think many people then echo happily. This will be the end of, the, of school as we know it. And that is a promise for great transformation. And it's inevitable, right? That's the way in which the story goes. This is inevitable. New players will be able to enter the market, again, at this low, low cost area. Their products will be low quality, but they're going to be able to displace the incumbent organizations. The brick and mortar schools will be gone. And according to Christensen, who wrote in his book, Disrupting Class, disruption will be necessary in an overdue chapter in our public schools. Now, of course, much like happens when many millennialist prophets lay claim to a specific date, much like Harold Camping in his October 21st, oops, Christensen has sort of revised some of his predictions as well. Um, he actually says that disrupting classes might look a little bit different than what he looked, wrote about five years ago. Earlier this year, he revised some of his predictions to say, well, maybe education isn't going to be a disruptive innovation. Maybe what we'll see is a hybrid innovation instead. Um, it'll be blended learning. It'll be a little bit online, a little bit offline. It might not be doom, in fact, because we're going to see this way in which he says, quote, the future of elementary schools will be a sustaining innovation in this, in this country. Computer hardware, shockingly, will not actually change everything, go figure. Of course, you know, even in this book, he still talks about, or in this white paper, he still has a sort of prediction of education technology as being about changing business practices as well. This is an end times belief that is very much about how do we change the business practices, not necessarily how do we change learning, how do we change teaching. And of course, there are these elements in the way of reshaping and bringing about this salvation. Quote, uh, Christensen says, people do not create disruptive innovation models in, excuse me, disruptive business models in public education um, because public education is set up as a public utility and state laws mandate attendance for virtually everyone. So there is no large untapped non-consumer which is an important part of his framework to be able to sort of disrupt and create new models. 
So then we sort of call, he sort of revises his prediction because of it, the way in which education works, it might not actually fall into the same transformative story that he assigned to other, to other industries. There are limits to his predictions, he admits, to his predictive models, because education might be different. Again, but I want to make it clear that this isn't just a matter of predicting the future. This isn't just a notion of sort of getting uh, billboards and saying that doom is coming. This isn't just a matter of sort of talking about the end times. This is also a matter of sort of actively moving the conversation towards a certain end. Clayton Christensen Institute, the, the place in which he, he now works with others, it doesn't just offer this sort of story. It's actually actively working to sort of move us in a particular way. It doesn't just sort of diagnose the world, it's actually helping to shape it. It's written these books, it talks all the time, it lobbies about certain changes, it lobbies to create this world in which it wants to move towards. Sort of an embrace of for-profit education, a brace, an embrace of online for-profit providers, a move towards virtual schools, and lobbying efforts to help change their restrictions to make this sort of end times move more seamlessly. Over time, according to its white paper, disruptive models for blended learning will improve and they will prevail. They will prevail over the tra tra traditional classroom. That's the prediction. According to the mythology, disruption will prevail. So it is written, so it is told, and that's the mythology. Again, I was trained as a folklorist, and I was trained to be incredibly respectful of people's sacred stories. They're true. They believe in them. But at the same time, now I can say I'm a recovering addict, a recovering addict, recovering academic. It is sort of similar, strangely <laughs> enough. A recovering academic, and I don't actually have to sort of be beholden to um, the, good, the, good, um, the good ethnographic practices of my folklorist um, past. So I can actually challenge these questions and say, WTF, like really, why are we accepting these stories on faith? Who says that in 50 years time, there will only be 10 universities left in the world? Why, why is that the future? Why are we listening to these stories, right? What are these stories telling us about the future of education? What are they asking us to believe? Who do they assign in terms of salvation? Why are they putting salvation in the hands of technology and not in the hands of people? Why are they putting salvation in the hands of markets and not in the hands of communities? Why are we accepting any of these stories to be true? What happens when we embrace these stories about an end times? What happens when we sort of live in this world where we see doom and crisis and apocalyptic rhetoric all about us and we live in this sort of state of pending Armageddon and destruction? What does that create in, sort of, in terms of our ability to move forward? What does that create in terms of opportunities for other people to come in with their, their particular stories? How are we living in a crisis narrative right now? And what do we think of in terms of who will save us? Why would we believe a gospel according to artificial intelligence, or in terms of Harvard Business School, or in terms of Thomas Friedman, right? What is sacred when we think about the stories that we tell one another about education, about the work that we do, about why education matters, what is most sacred in the work that we do in moving those conversations forward? And then when we stop to think about it, what is actually being held up as being unassailable and unquestionable? And then also, I think we should pause and think, really, what stories are being told that are quite profane? Thank you. I guess time for questions. I don't know. Question? No? Good. Okay, bye. <laughs> yes.
Um, <laughs> thank you very much for your presentation. I'm interested in those stories that are sort of at the other end of that mm -hmm. continuum, the ones about how our digital native students, just by being around technology, somehow absorb all this uh, technological literacy and stories like, or those sacred texts, the Horizon Report, um, <laughs> that say things like, any minute now, gaming is gonna be part of higher education. You know, and they've been saying it for years and years and years and years. The problem is that very often the people who are running our institutions are listening to those mythologies. Maybe they're also listening to the apocaly apocalyptic ones, but the problem is that it almost seems like it's pushing us further apart because they turn around and say, hey, what's wrong with you? The Horizon Report says we should be doing gaming. Why aren't you? Oh, you know. So it worries me. What, what kinds of things could we be helping our institutional presidents, chancellors, provosts, look at, read, hear about, think about that might uh, combat maybe both ends of that continuum. I think the Horizon Report is a really interesting comparison because that is sort of this sort of predictive narrative where in one to three years or in three to five years or in ten years time, um, so it does have this sort of time stamp to it and I would say that on one hand we can sort of look, as you said, look at the ways in which we've had these predictions um, about what's coming and it's always sort of in the, in the future. So I think in some ways if we can sort of shape it that way, it's, it's not this notion of um, panicky, we must do something right now today because the end is coming. If we can sort of have a more, um, uh, a more measured and nuanced conversation about, about the future. That this isn't some, and that this isn't, um, I mean in some ways the Horizon Report does sort of have this inevitability to it that, um, interestingly this year, 3D printing was, appeared in the, I think on the five to 10 year horizon, and it was actually in the very first horizon report um, when they carved it into stone um, several millennia ago. So I think that we just have to have a more measured conversation, and I think step back away from the crisis rhetoric. I think it is the crisis, it is this crisis panicky rhetoric that definitely gets translated into the David Brooks and the Thomas Friedman type publications where you must do something today because if not, you will be swept away in the sort of inevitable change um, of events. So, I mean, I think we just have to have more calm and nuanced conversations, which aren't actually that, they don't make for great headlines, but they do tend to make for better conversation. Thank you, Roger. Um, I'll just talk really loud. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, I think following on that, I think part of the reason why that sort of apocalyptic conversation happens is because it motivates action, right? It's, it's, it's hard to get people to feel like, yes, we're all gonna gather together and travel hundreds of miles so we can make tiny incremental but otherwise really, frankly, unnecessary changes. You know, and so where, is, where are the countervailing voices that, that have a different framing, have a positivist view that maybe isn't all just, you know, technology is going to swoop in and so on. I mean, do you have, other than yourself, oh, so you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and maybe, I mean, I can just think of a, a tiny number of people that are kind of saying, yes, there's a lot to be done. We're really excited to do it, but it's not because everything's going to hell in a handbasket, right? It's, it's, there's a different framing that still motivates action. I mean, I think that that's actually, you know, not, not to pander to the crowd here, but I think that that actually is a lot of people in this room. I mean, I, I, and I think that this, this is one of the great, this is one of the, the, the great mysteries, is that, you know, we've been, many of us have been talking about these things for a very long time, and now suddenly we get swept up into this other conversation that appears in the New York Times. Um, but, uh, I mean, I do think that people who are working within institutions who are making change, and maybe it is, maybe it is incremental change, maybe it isn't like capital, capital R radical where the robots come in and, teach our intro to biology classes, and that's okay. But I think that people working with institutions are doing really innovative things, and I think that they're, it just, it isn't, it isn't as sexy a story as um, the doom and gloom, or on the other side, this sort of salvation. So, so um, it's part of the process to say that, that um, the problem with dying was that you don't know how things turn out after you're dead. And so he, and he was obsessed with 
with the end of the world. And part of that, I think, was dealing with the fact that everything's just so much larger than we are. And at some point, we're going to be gone and things are going to keep moving. Do you think that it's possible that all this stuff about doom and gloom has to do with the fact that, the, that things are just rolling and, and moving along in ways that kind of boggle our minds? And maybe that's just a way of coping with, with the way that things are evolving and changing. I mean, I do think that that's, I mean, that's what's interesting to me about sort of the rise and fall. There are different moments in American history, which admittedly is sort of this very American-centric talk, but American history in which sort of people, there is a more apocalyptic, um, a more apocalyptic acceptance of, and belief in an apocalypse. Certainly as a child of the Reagan era, um, I was convinced for many years that we were all going to die in a nuclear holocaust. Uh, holocaust, thank you, Ronald Reagan, for traumatizing me that way. Um, and so I, I do think that there are times in which we believe that the end of the world is near. Um, like 9-11, I think, enhanced those fears. I think that Y2K was an early glimpse at the way in which we were afraid of what technology was going to do. And I think that there is this notion today. I'm not sure if it's, again, I'm not sure how much of this is perception or reality, but I do think that there is this idea that technology is changing really rapidly. I mean, look how many iPhones have come out in the last, you know, five years. We're up to iPhone 5. That's mind-blowingly innovative. Um, <laughs> but I do think that there's this, uh, there's, this, there's this sense that technology is changing really rapidly, and that is frightening. Now, I'm not sure that the iPhone 5 is really something that um, is actually that different than the first iPhone. I mean, it's, you know, I won't give the Apple out. It's sleeker. It's lighter. It doesn't drop calls as often. Um, but I think that there's, a, there's this notion that we're, moving, when we're in a time of rapid technological change, and I do think that that makes people frightened. And I do think that that sort of helps sweep along these conversations that um, we, must, we must respond quickly because we're in, we're in a moment of, of crisis. And I think, you know, again, sort of like take a deep breath and sure, things, have, things are changing, but um, that's the great thing about history is that, and the world is that things are always changing, and so. Last question. No questions. <laughs> uh, okay, so my question is, uh, is the following. Like 18 years ago, 15 years ago, I saw the first movie that I saw streamed on a computer, and I remember thinking, like, that's it, Blockbuster's done in three or five years. And this week, it they announced their closing. So, so not to say, oh, I'm, I'm with the Holocaust people, but I think it's, technology is often overrated how quickly it's going to get here. But it, it does keep on trucking along and sort of show up. And some of these things do end up happening. So is there a tendency, like it's easy to make fun of them. They said five years, all the universities are gone. Well, that didn't happen in 10 and 15. But isn't there a certain reality that these technology things do eventually sweep into the places that in some ways some people see earlier? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure how much of this is an inevitability. I mean, I'm not sure how much that Blockbuster, I mean, Blockbuster's dealing with different sorts of, um, there are all sorts of other factors, I think, that have led to the demise of Blockbuster. I mean, you could still go to Redbox and get, uh, uh, get rent your video there. Um, so I think that, you know, Blockbuster is, um, Blockbuster has, the, the failure of Blockbuster is more than just a sort of inevitability of the rise of streaming, the takeover of streaming video. The world is a lot. I think the world is pretty complicated. Um, that's a real shocking observation. The, the world is complicated, and I think a lot of these things, they aren't, um, they, they just don't unfold the way in which um, the, the narrative, the narrative oversimplifies that. I mean, it's the same with, the, you know, the, the death of the newspaper, as someone who's a journalist, or the death of journalism. Um, you know, I think that I'm not sure that we can sort of, we can sort of just wash our hands of, of newspapers in the way that fits so neatly into a simple, a simple narrative. Things change, and I think that people change. You know, people develop new patterns, and I think that people also decide at some points that they actually really like old tech. The return of the, you know, that that people are collecting records again. That people are sort of realizing that wow, actually, like records were this really kick-ass old technology, and that you know, that that people are sort of returning to some of this old media. I'm not sure that like this notion that technology always supplants old technology is necessarily is necessarily true. Great. Thank you.